A very good evening aspirants. I welcome you all to the Hindu Daily News Analysis brought to you by Shankarayas Academy. Today I am going to cover 8 different news articles from the Hindu newspaper dated 10th of January 2023 and displayed here are the list of news articles that we will be discussing today. You can go through it and those who have not yet subscribed our YouTube channel, please subscribe and do hit the bell icon button to get regular notifications regarding our content based videos. Now with this note, let us get into first news article discussion. Now for our first discussion, we are going to take this news article. It says that a rogue wild elephant was captured in Wayanad district by the forest and wildlife department. The elephant was codenamed as Pandalur Makna elephant or PM2. As per the article, it was captured from the Kuppadi forest in the Wayanad wildlife sanctuary and shifted to Mutanga. And this is the crux of the news article given here. In this context, let us understand about Wayanad Wildlife Sanctuary from exam perspective. First of all know that Wayanad Wildlife Sanctuary is made up of two pockets. They include Muttanga in the south and Tolpetti in the north. See the Muttanga lies adjacent to three protected areas. They are firstly Bandipur Tiger Reserve in Karnataka, secondly Mudumalai Wildlife Sanctuary in Tamil Nadu and thirdly Sultan Bateri and Kuruchiyath Ranges within Kerala. Now what about Tolpetti? Tolpetti lies adjacent to Nagarhol range of Karnataka. Apart from this, know that Wayanad Wildlife Sanctuary is part of Nilgiri Biosphere Reserve. This is about the geographical location of Wayanad Wildlife Sanctuary. Now coming to topography and climate, undulating hills and thick greenery are characteristics of Wayanad Wildlife Sanctuary. Here undulating means having a continuous smooth rising and falling form. That is just like waves on the sea. Now look at this image. This is only undulating hills. Know that the highest peak in Wayanad Wildlife Sanctuary is Karotimala, which is situated above 3800 feet above mean sea level. See the elevated landscape of the Wildlife Sanctuary ensures a cool climate. The temperature will fall up to 13 degrees Celsius during winter and rise up to 32 degrees Celsius during summer. A good rainfall of about 2200 millimeter is experienced by the area and usually heavy rainfalls occur from June to August. This is about the topography and climate of the wildlife sanctuary. Now moving on to see forest types, flora and fauna. See tropical moist and dry deciduous forest types cover most of the area of the sanctuary. Few patches of semi evergreen forests are also there. Bamboo groups intervened with moist deciduous forests is also another characteristics of the sanctuary. Also know that one third of the sanctuary is covered by plantations of teak, rosewood, eucalyptus and silver oak. Pelu, rosewood, kaduka, velachadachi, axelwood and padri are the dominant tree species. Know that the sanctuary is home for variety of animals. The sanctuary has the presence of big cats like tiger, panther etc. And langurs, bonnet macaques, bison, monkeys, sambar deer, malabar bear and even slender lorries can be seen in the area. The other fauna of the region include crocodiles, a type of gecko called termite hill gecko, chameleon, flying lizard, mountain lizard, skinx and flapshell turtles are seen in the Wayanad wildlife sanctuary. Know that about 216 species of birds like peacock, owl, babbler, woodpeckers, cuckoo and jungle fowl are found in the area. Note that a rare blue bearded bee eater has also been sighted in Wayanad. And that's all regarding this discussion. In this discussion, we saw about Wayanad Wildlife Sanctuary. Then we saw about the geographical location of Wayanad Wildlife Sanctuary. Then we saw about topography and climate of the sanctuary. And finally, we saw about forest types, flora and fauna of the wildlife sanctuary. See, this topic is very important from the prelims perspective. UPSC may put a question regarding Wayanad Wildlife Sanctuary. So make note of each and every points that we discussed. Now with these key points in mind, let's move on to the next news article discussion. Now have a look at this text and context page article. It talks about the increasing human-animal conflict in the state of Kerala. This article gives multiple examples of recent animal transgressions in the district of Wayanad in Kerala. This is the crux of the news article given here. Now in this context, let us learn about human-animal conflict, then about the causes and impacts of human-animal conflict and finally we will see some solutions to solve this problem. Now before getting into discussion, the syllabus relevant to this topic is given here. You can go through it. 
Now first let's start with the term human animal conflict. See human wildlife interaction can be negatively termed as human animal conflict. See if the human wildlife interaction results in threatening people's safety and livelihoods then it is termed as human animal conflict. Here IUCN that is International Union for Conservation of Nature adds another dimension to the term human animal conflict. See the term human wildlife conflict has traditionally been applied only to the negative interactions between people and wildlife. IUCN says that the term ignores the conflicts between groups of people themselves about what should be done to resolve the situation. So according to IUCN human animal conflict also includes the conflicts arising between humans to the question what should be done to solve the negative impacts of human animal interaction. For example, let's say there is an elephant transgression into human area in a particular village. Here the local community proposes a particular method to stop the elephants from getting into human settlements, which is different to the strategy of wildlife conservation experts. So there is a conflict between the two groups of people on how to deal with the elephants. So according to IUCN, this can also be termed as conflicts arising out of human animal interaction. And this is all about human animal conflict. Now let's see the causes of human animal conflict. Firstly, there is a huge incursion by humans into the wildlife habitats, which brings the wildlife into direct contact with human settlements. So this is the first cause of human animal conflict. Secondly, there is a growth in human population along the peripheries of wildlife sanctuaries and national parks. So the growing population near the wildlife habitats has been another cause of human animal conflict. And thirdly, agricultural fields along the boundaries of protected areas have brought the wildlife to forage for food in the fields. When farmers try to protect the fields, this results in direct confrontation with the wildlife. See, these are all some of the causes for human animal conflict. Now coming to the effects of human animal conflict. See, human animal conflict affects both the animal and the humans. Firstly, there is a danger to life and livelihoods of people. In India, every year, hundreds of people and animals die due to human-animal conflict. According to the Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change, 125 humans died in conflict with tigers between 2018 to 2020. And 1,503 humans died in the human-elephant conflict between 2018-19 and 2020-21. So the danger to life and livelihoods of people is the first and foremost effect of human-animal conflict. Secondly, there is a danger to the life of animal self, as normally people will try to escape the situation by harming the animal. This is the second reason. So the effects of human-animal conflict can result in both the wildlife and the humans getting affected. Now finally, let's see some solutions to solve human-animal conflict. Firstly, erection of fences along the borders of the protected areas to stop the wildlife from coming into contact with the human settlement. Some of the fences used here include beehive fences, solar electric fences, etc. See, the erection of fences will help us to avoid human-animal conflict. Secondly, conservation measures like destroying invasive species inside the reserves, then replenishing water bodies, then planting necessary fodder crops within the forest. See, these steps are done to provide with the necessary life-sustaining elements for the wildlife inside their habitat itself. And this reduces the need for wildlife to venture out of their habitats. So this will also avoid human-animal conflict. And thirdly, infrastructure development like watchtowers, then installation of cameras and tracking devices are provided to forest officials to have a continuous check on the movement of wildlife. This will also reduce human-animal conflict. And finally, animal corridors should be built and maintained. And these pathways play an important role in safe movement of the wildlife, thus avoiding man-made disturbances. See, these are all some of the ways in which human-wildlife conflict can be tackled. And that's all regarding this discussion. In this discussion, we saw about what is mean by human-animal conflict, then about the causes and effects of human-animal conflict. And finally, we saw some solutions to tackle human-wildlife conflict. See, this topic is very important from the main's perspective because human wildlife conflict is coming in news frequently. So, UPSC may put a main's question regarding causes and effects of human wildlife conflict in a main's question. So, make note of each and every points that we discussed. Now, with these key points in mind, let's move on to the next news article discussion. Now, look at this news article here. It talks about the poor state of revenue collection by the municipal corporations in India. Last year, a study titled Report on Municipal Finances was published by the Reserve Bank of India. The study reveals how municipal bodies are increasingly dependent on fund transfers from the state and the centre. 
the study also says that the revenue earning capacity of these municipal corporations is limited so in this context we will discuss the content of this article from our exam perspective before that the syllabus relevant to this discussion is given here kindly go through it now let's begin by understanding the basics of municipal corporations see in india the municipal corporations are the urban local government that is responsible for the development of any metropolitan city having a population of more than 1 million people we all know that the 74th constitutional amendment act established the urban local governments here you should have an idea on what other bodies come under municipality see the 74th constitutional amendment act provides for three types of municipalities firstly nagar panchayat this is for transitional area that is an area which is being transformed from a rural to an urban area then secondly municipal council this is for smaller urban area and finally municipal corporation this is for larger urban area see this news article talks about this particular municipal corporation only know that the three bodies take care of matters listed in the 12th schedule of the indian constitution but for this they need funds right however they are lacking it because their source of revenue is limited the taxes earned by municipal corporations in india are grossly inadequate to meet their expenditure needs the author of the article explains this through some graphs now we will see them one by one and we will try to analyze it okay see the own tax revenue of municipal corporations comprises property tax water tax toll tax and other local taxes these taxes formed 31 to 34 percentage of the total revenue in the financial year 18 to financial year 20 period Sadly this share is low compared to many other countries and it has also declined over time now look at this graph the share of own revenue the total revenue of urban local bodies in india has declined here by the term the total revenue i mean all the modes through which they make money including government transfers here if you closely observe you can note that the share of government transfers has increased over the years when you grow up you are supposed to make money for your own needs right you can't keep depending on your parents for long this is what happening here too see the municipal corporations are becoming increasingly dependent on the government and their source of revenue is very limited now if we speak in terms of gdp in 2017 to 18 the revenue receipts of these bodies was estimated to be 0.61 percentage of the gdp and according to budget estimates of 2019 to 20 it increased slightly to 0.72 percentage of the gdp Again this is much smaller than Brazil's 7 percentage and South Africa's 6 percentage. Now there are state wise variations as well. Now look at this graph. For states like Delhi, Gujarat, Chandigarh, the share of municipal corporations revenue as a share of state GDP is more than 1 percentage. On the other hand, it is 0.1 percentage or less in Karnataka, Goa, Assam and Sikkim. And moreover, if you see the municipal corporations are highly dependent on the property taxes. In 2017 to 18 the property taxes formed over 40 percentage of municipal corporations own tax revenue despite such dominance property tax collection in india is much lower compared to the organization for economic cooperation and development countries due to undervaluation and poor administration if you have been reading the chennai edition of hindu newspaper regularly you would have come across a report published on this monday regarding this it highlighted the problems associated with the property tax collection The article said that of the 13.27 lakh assessors in Chennai, only 6.94 lakh paid the property tax, while 6.33 lakh were yet to pay. This is because of the shortage of tax collectors. There are many modern modes of payment, but still more than 55 percentage of the property tax collection is done by tax collectors. Around 200 wards have over 7,000 assessors and just one tax collector. Now, if you see this graph. you will be able to observe that most cities have tried to increase their property taxes over the period however the increasing population density and urbanization rate might have played a role in this apart from the efforts made by the corporation themselves all this shows that the revenue sources of municipal corporations are limited now we will see how the expenditure part turns out to be now look at this graph it shows that the percentage of total expenditure of municipal corporations in 2017 to 18 See over 70 percent was spent on revenue expenditures such as salaries, wages, bonus that constitute 25 percent, then operational and maintenance charges that constitute 16.2 percent, then pensions that contributes 7.4 percent, etc. Now we have less than 30 percent left out for capital expenditure. 
So the author concludes by saying that the corporations are mostly dependent on fund transfers from the state and the center, and their revenue raising potential is very limited. Apart from this, the property taxes are not efficiently collected. The author also says that the generated funds are mostly spent on revenue expenditure, leaving a much smaller pie for capacity building. And that's all regarding this news article. In this news article, we saw about municipal corporations and the state of revenue of municipal corporations with the help of graphs. See, this topic is very important from the mains perspective. You can use these points while writing your mains answer. This will definitely enrich your mains answer. Now, with these key points in mind, let's move on to the next news article discussion. Now, look at this news article here. This article again is about an evergreen topic in UPSC. It is about the tussle between the state government and governor. See, the trouble began after the Tamil Nadu governor, Mr. Ravi, in his special address to the Tamil Nadu State Legislative Assembly. He skipped a paragraph containing references to regional stalwarts and the term Dravidian model of governance. And this address was disapproved by the Tamil Nadu Chief Minister M K Stalin. So the governor walked out of the assembly, and this created trouble in the state. And this is the crux of the news article given here. Now in this context, today we will see some important articles in Indian Constitution related to governor. Now first of all, let's see about Article 174. This article is about the sessions of the state legislature, its prorogation and dissolution. According to the Article 174, the governor has the power to summon the state legislative assembly and the state legislative council whenever he thinks fit. But the time interval between one session and the other should not be more than six months. The governor also has the power to prorogue both state legislative assembly and state legislative council, and he also has the power to dissolve the state legislative assembly of the state. This is about Article 174. The next article that we are going to say is Article 175. It is about the right of governor to address and send messages to the house or houses. According to this Article 175, the governor has the right to address the state legislative assembly and state legislative council separately or together. And for this governor's address, the attendance of the members is required. Additionally, Article 175 says that governor has the right to send messages to the houses of state legislature regarding a pending bill in that house, and the house should take into consideration the matter mentioned in that message. This is about Article 175. Now, finally, let's see about Article 176. It is about special address by the governor. It is said under this article that governor will address the legislative assembly at the commencement of the first session after each general election to the legislative assembly and the commencement of first session of each year. If a state contains legislative council, then both houses will be assembled together. In this special address, the governor will inform the causes of summons to the legislature. The address of the governor contains. a review of the activities and achievements of the particular state government during the previous year then the address also include policies with regard to important internal problems as well as a brief account of the program of government business for the session know that after the governor's address time should be allotted for discussing the matters referred in the address made by the governor and here only problem rose in the tamil nadu legislative assembly See yesterday in his address, the Tamil Nadu government skipped certain paragraphs as it was presented to him by the state government, and this address was disapproved by the Tamil Nadu CM while discussing about the address. So this is the ongoing tussle between governor and the state government in Tamil Nadu. That's all regarding this discussion. In this discussion we saw about three important articles in the Constitution which is related to governor. See there is a possibility that we will get questions regarding special address by the governor. So make note of each and every points that we discussed. Now with these key points in mind, let's move on to the next news article discussion. Now have a look at this editorial page article. This article talks about corruption. Now corruption is suddenly news because in last December the Supreme Court made a judgment in the case of Neeraj Dutta versus Government of NCT of Delhi. In this judgment, the Constitution Bench of the Supreme Court took a harsh stance against corruption among public employees in the nation. it even lowered the bar for the amount of evidence needed to convict those accused of corruption even though this is not the first time the supreme court is addressing the issue still the level of corruption in public life has not decreased this is the crux of the news article given here now in this context let us quickly go through what is corruption and some of the reasons for corruptions in public service 
Now, before getting into discussion, the syllabus relevant to this topic is given here. You can go through it. First of all, what is corruption? See, the word corrupt is derived from the Latin word corruptus, meaning to break or destroy. According to the World Bank, the abuse of public power for private benefits is defined as corruption. This does not mean that the corruption does not exist within private sector. See, especially in large private enterprises, this phenomenon clearly exists in procurement or even in hiring process. Now, some of the examples of corrupt behavior would include bribery, extortion, fraud, embezzlement, nepotism, cronyism, appropriation of public assets and property for private use and influence peddling. This is about corruption. Now, moving on to the causes of corruption. See, there are numerous reasons for corruption in public services. Now, we will see them one by one. Now, first, let's start with the historical reason, that is, the legacy issues. See, at the time of independence, there was widespread poverty and the government's coffers were empty. This resulted in consistent low salaries for officials. Then, the pre liberalization license raj fed by monopolies and restrictive trade practices and this also aided the corruption. Apart from this, the lack of economic freedom, then necessities of development overshadowed vigilance procedures. That is, when developmental needs take priority over vigilance measures, then the corruption could occur. This is the first reason. Then the second major reason is political system. See, use of black money in elections to win at any cost creates the need for recovery of that cost through malpractices. Here I am not telling that all the money used to fund election is black money. Since election funding is also not transparent, elections are made prone to the usage of black money and fundings based on quid pro quo. And that is why black money brought in. Here, quid pro quo means something for something. It describes a situation when two parties engage in a mutual agreement to exchange goods or services reciprocally. The issue does not stop there. They ultimately result in chronic capitalism. Chronic capitalism is an unholy alliance between politicians and corporates. Apart from all this, criminalization of politics actually lead to corruption. Just imagine, when the rule breakers become rule makers, then the casualty is the rule of law, right? This is the second major reason. Then the third major reason is economic structure. See, only 10% of the economy is formalized. And this encourages the growth of black money. Then, stringent compliance rules for entry and exit for businesses also result in bribery. Most importantly, the unequal distribution of wealth may also lead to corruption. Have you ever been in a situation where someone else could enjoy privileges while you were bad from them just because they have more money? This is what I mean by unequal distribution of wealth. This is the third major reason. Then the fourth major reason for corruption is legal lacunae. Here lacunae mean an unfilled space or a gap. See the Indian Penal Code was drafted by the first law commission which was chaired by Thomas Babington Macaulay. It was drafted in 1834 and submitted to the Council of Governor General of India in the year 1835. Such archaic laws do not capture the complexities of administration and lead to escape of wrongdoers. Then lacunae in the Lokpal Act, then delays in the appointments of important office both at the centre and the state levels, then dilution of RT Act and political misuse of CBI and other agencies also causes corruption in the country. This is the fourth major reason. The fifth major reason is administrative lacunae. See, discretionary powers granted to officials by loopholes make work prone to corruption. Then lack of resources, funding, infrastructure and manpower in the vigilance institutions can also cause corruption. Then lack of incorporation of standard practices by organizations like banks, sports organizations. So this also result in multi-billion rupee scams. You can remember the examples here, the recent Punjab National Bank scam and the Commonwealth scam in 2010 Commonwealth Games. See, these are all the examples of corruption in India. Then the sixth major reason is judicial delays. See, lack of production to good Samarthians, then targeting of upright and non-corrupt officials, and rewards to corrupt officials, then near non-existent whistleblowers production are also the reasons for corruptions in India. Then the sixth major problem is social problems. See, it is the mindset of the citizenry that doesn't look at the problem seriously and even accepts it as a necessary part of the system. Then increasing consumerism is the new middle class that is ready to bribe to get things done. Most importantly, failure of social morality, then education system to inculcate the values are also some of the reasons for corruption in India. See, these are all the reasons for corruptions in India and that's all regarding this discussion. In this discussion we saw about what is corruption and we also saw about some of the major reasons 
for corruptions in India. Now with these key points in mind, let's move on to the next news article discussion. Now let us move on to this news article. This article is about the Supreme Court judgment regarding the upholding of one rank one pension scheme. And this is for the armed forces. And the Supreme Court gave time to the government till March 15 to comply with 2022 judgment of Supreme Court regarding one rank one pension scheme. And this is about the news article given here. Now in this context, let us understand about the one rank one pension scheme from Plum's perspective. See, in the year 2015, the one rank one pension scheme was introduced by the central government. One rank one pension scheme implies a uniform pension for defense personnel retiring in the same rank with the same length of service and regardless of their date of retirement. Now, what is the need for this one rank one pension? See, military personnel across the three services, that is Air Force, Army and Navy, fall under two categories. The first category is officers and the other category includes other ranks than the officers. Due to the need of the different forces to maintain physical fitness, efficiency and effectiveness, military personnel retire at an early age compared to other agencies of the government. See, a SIPA in the Army and equivalent rank personnel in Navy and Air Force retire after 17 to 19 years of service and military officers retire before attaining the age of 60 years. Before the implementation of one rank one pension, the calculation of pension was linked to the pay drawn by the personnel in a particular pay scale at the time of his or her retirement. We know that pay scales are revised to the higher side generally on the recommendation of pay commissions. So the personnel retiring after the revision of the pay scales got more pension than those who had already retired. Hence the gap remained in the pension of the past and present retirees. So, to bridge this gap only, one rank one pension scheme was introduced retrospectively from July 1st, 2014 with 2013 as the base year. This is all about one rank one pension scheme. Now let us see the problem with this. See a petition was filed regarding the one rank one pension. The petition said that the government had altered the initial definition of one rank one pension. The petition said the principle of one rank one pension has been replaced by one rank multiple pensions for the persons with same length of service. According to the petitioners, this was arbitrary and unconstitutional under Article 14 and 21. But the Supreme Court did not agree with the argument that the government's 2015 policy communication contradicted the original decision to implement one rank one pension. And finally, the Supreme Court upheld the one rank one pension scheme. And that's all regarding this discussion. In this discussion, we saw about one rank, one pension scheme, then about the need for one rank, one pension. And finally, we saw about the issue which is the one rank, one pension. Now, with these key points in mind, let's move on to the next news article discussion. Now, have a look at this news article. It talks about the Supreme Court's observation regarding a case relating to uniform civil code. The case challenged the validity of a committee formed by Uttarakhand government to look into the implementation of uniform civil code. The petitioner argued that the state governments do not have the necessary authority to constitute a committee with respect to implementation of uniform civil code. The petitioner also argued that only union government could set up a committee for the implementation of uniform civil code. So Supreme Court in its observation has said that state government's power to constitute a committee to examine the implementation of uniform civil code cannot per se be challenged. This is the crux of the news article given here. Now in this context, let us learn about the significance of Uniform Civil Code. Now before that, we will see briefly about what is mean by Uniform Civil Code. See, Uniform Civil Code is nothing but a code which encompasses a single personal law for all citizens irrespective of religion, sex, gender and sexual orientation. The Uniform Civil Code calls for the formulation of one law for all Indians regarding civil cases. That is, the Uniform Civil Code envisions a single law that is applicable to all religious communities in matters such as marriage, divorce, inheritance and adoption. And note that this Uniform Civil Code comes under Article 44 of the Indian Constitution. So what does this Article 44 say? The Article 44 lays down that the state shall endeavor to secure a Uniform Civil Code for the citizens throughout the territory of India. Here note that Article 44 comes under DPSP. Since Uniform Civil Code comes under DPSP, it is not enforceable by court of law, but it can be enforceable by procedure established by law. 
it means that anything under part 4 that is dpsp of the indian constitution can only be enforced by parliament through a particular law this is what given in the article 37 of the indian constitution and this is all about uniform civil code and its implementation here note that the india has uniform criminal law for everyone but there is no uniform civil law now coming to the significance of uniform civil code as you all know india is a secular country without any state religion so to allow various religious communities to have a civil law of their own which is different from the other communities goes against the ideal of secularism so implementation of uniform civil code will make india a truly secular country with uniform civil laws for everyone in the country normally personal laws of a religion are discriminatory towards the women so india by allowing separate civil personal laws to exist allows the operation of discriminatory provisions which are against women so by implementing uniform civil code we can put an end to this discriminatory practices against women see these are all the two main advantages associated with implementation of uniform civil code and that's all regarding this discussion in this discussion we saw about what is uniform civil code then we saw about the constitutional provisions relating to uniform civil code and finally we saw some significance of uniform civil code in india now with these key points in mind let's move on to the next news article discussion now look at this front page article the news is that yesterday our prime minister inaugurated the 17th pravasi bharatiya divas convention The 17th Pravasi Bharatiya Divas Convention is being observed from 8th to 10th January 2023 in Indore, Madhya Pradesh. The theme of the 17th Pravasi Bharatiya Divas is Diaspora Reliable Partners for India's Progress in Amrit Kaal. And this is the crux of the news article given here. Now in this context, let us learn about Pravasi Bharatiya Divas, then Pravasi Bharatiya Samman Awards, and finally we will see some facts about overseas Indians. Now let's start with Pravasi Bharatiya Divas. We shortly call this as PBD. See, as a part of PBD Convention, the Pravasi Bharatiya Divas, or the Day for Non-Resident Indians, is observed on Jan 9th to mark the contribution of overseas Indian community towards the development of India. Note that January 9th was selected as it was the date when Mahatma Gandhi returned to India from South Africa in 1915. See the tradition of celebrating Pravasi Bharatiya Divas started in 2003. The first PBD convention was organized on 9th January 2003 and since 2015 under a revised format PBD convention has been organized once every 2 years. Note that the Pravasi Bharatiya Divas convention is organized by the Ministry of External Affairs and the Confederation of Indian Industries. It is held in a different city each time. with the aim of showcasing the diversity and progress of different regions of india and this year it is happening in indore now another important aspect of pbd is the pravasi bharatiya samman awards the pravasi bharatiya samman awards are a prestigious honor bestowed upon non resident indians and people of indian origin who have made significant contributions to their respective fields and also have promoted india's interests abroad Now the Pravasi Bharatiya Samman Awards are classified into three categories that is Pravasi Bharatiya Samman Pravasi Bharatiya Samman Gold and Pravasi Bharatiya Samman Lifetime Achievement Now first let's take Pravasi Bharatiya Samman see it is given to NRIs and persons of Indian origin who have made significant contributions to their respective fields then Pravasi Bharatiya Samman Gold This is given to those who have made exceptional contributions in their respective fields and finally Pravasi Bharatiya Samman lifetime achievement See this is given to NRIs and persons of Indian origin who have made outstanding contributions to their respective fields over a long period of time So this is all about Pravasi Bharatiya Divas and Pravasi Bharatiya Samman Awards Now we will understand about overseas Indians See overseas Indians are those people who have left India and are living in other countries. According to the Ministry of External Affairs, the overseas Indian is divided into three parts. Firstly, non-resident Indian. See they are Indians who go to other countries for employment or education and later to settle there. Secondly, person of Indian origin. These include those people who were either born in India or have family ties in India. And finally, overseas citizen of India. See they are the people who are citizens of India on or after 26th January 1950 and who are now settled abroad or put in this overseas citizen of India category. Now why is this overseas citizens are significant for India? See overseas Indians have an important role in benefiting the country. 
these indians who have settled abroad not only bring laurels to the country but also they never hold back from helping the country we all know that the migrants are also the biggest source of foreign exchange in india indians are the top in terms of sending foreign exchange to the country followed by mexico and then the people of china last year indian expatriates sent 100 billion us dollars to the country then some people have become the ceo of big companies and even some occupy big positions in other countries we may take google ceo sundar pichai then adobe ceo shantanu narayan then microsoft's satya nadella then ibm sarvind krishna and master card ceo ajay pal singh they are all persons of indian origin then we can also take example of kamala harris who is the vice president of america and rishi sunak who recently become the pm of britain see they are also persons of indian origin therefore the overseas indians play an important role in deciding their economic and political status abroad see you can use these points in your main answer writing so kindly add these points to your notes and that's all regarding this discussion in this discussion we saw about pravasi bharti divas then pravasi bharti samman awards and finally we saw about overseas citizens of india now with these key points in mind let's move on to the next part of the news article discussion that is to discuss preliminary practice questions now look at this first question this question is regarding nilgiri biosphere reserve here four options are given we have to find which of the following protected areas are falling under nilgiri biosphere reserve know that nilgiri biosphere reserve was the first biosphere reserve in india established in the year 1986 it is located in the western ghats and it spread across three states that is tamil nadu kerala and karnataka and the protected areas within the nilgiri biosphere reserve include mudumalai wildlife sanctuary vayanadu wildlife sanctuary bandipur national park nahrol national park mukkurthi national park and silent valley national park now look at these four options here here option a is the correct answer as we saw these protected areas falls under nilgiri biosphere reserve so the correct answer is option a moving on let's take up the second question this question is a previous question which was asked in 2018 prelims the question is regarding governor now look at this first statement no criminal proceedings shall be instituted against the governor of a state in any court during his term of office actually this statement is correct like the president of india the governor of the state is also entitled to a number of privileges and immunities so during his term of office governor is immune from any criminal proceedings even in respect of his personal acts so statement one is correct now coming to the second statement the emoluments and allowances of the governor of a state shall not be diminished during his term of office this statement is also correct yes the governor is entitled to such emoluments allowances and privileges as may be determined by the parliament and his emoluments and allowances cannot be diminished during his term of office so statement two is correct here the question is asking for correct statement so the correct answer for the question is option c both one and two moving on let's take up the third question i will read out the question the vajra scheme is related to which of the following here four options are given we have to find vajra scheme is related to which of these four statements know that the vajra that is visiting advanced joint research scheme is a dedicated program for foreign scientists and academicians it gives emphasis on non resident indians then persons of indian origin and overseas citizens of india to work as adjunct faculty in the government funded academic and research institutions in india so the correct answer for the question is option c that is program for overseas indian faculties to teach in indian institutions and this is the quiz question for you today i will post this quiz question in your community section try to answer it and displayed here are the main questions for your practice go through the questions write your answers and post it in the comment section with this we came to the end of the video if you like the analysis please like comment and share and don't forget to subscribe to shankarai's academy youtube channel thank you for listening